There are times in every leader's life when they can choose to do the difficult thing, possibly to their own detriment, or sit back and just hope for the best. Those who take on the mantle of peacemaker lead with courage and often at their own personal risk. This is Abigail. Well, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Hope you're doing well. Welcome to Willow Crystal Lake. We have been in a series called Prayers for the Next President. And I have to say, when we started this series, we sent a promo out that we were going to be doing this series, uh, the trailer online. And I have to say, it got like all kinds of opinions and comments from every side. And it was a little bit of like some controversy and, and some uh, negative comments. And it actually got pretty nasty. So we, had to, we actually had to close and out the comments uh, during that first week leading into this series. Um, but what I've been very encouraged by is that since then, our church has been literally praying for our next president, uh, as well as praying for ourselves, and we've written those prayer cards. Does anyone know what I'm talking about? Um, when you came in, you may have seen them at the doors. You can actually grab that, and actually, in any time in the sermon, if you just feel like, I have a prayer, or I want to write something, or I don't want to forget this, you can go back, grab those cards if you'd like, and you can write down the prayer for, ne for the next president. But we've literally written thousands already that will be mailed to our next president in January, and I just love the idea that thousands of prayers from Willow Creek Community Church is going to be sent to our next president, and uh, I think there's power in that, and I think God is going to use that. And so throughout the message, if you just feel, hey, I, I, want, to, I want to pray, and you want to get a card, or if you just want to make a note on your way out, you can write a prayer for the next president and, uh, and then drop it off at our next steps or in those uh, blue little bins there that are at the doors as well. You can drop it off there, and uh, we'll be uh, sending those out in January. But um, as we've been in this series, we're talking today about courageous peace, and in the middle of a difficult, uh, co a conflicting kind of season, confusion and chaos, uh, peace and courageous peace is something that's very difficult. But Jesus uh, said something on the Sermon of the Mount. Now, Sermon of the Mount is the greatest sermon ever preached, okay? Uh, greatest sermon on the planet uh, ever preached was by Jesus. And in Matthew chapter 5, he says this in verse 9. He says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. And here's the thing. Um, when we're talking about peacemaking, what we're not talking about is peacekeeping. Peacekeeping would be more of uh, minimizing conflict or, or minimizing the implications around you and, and more or less avoiding stuff. But when I'm talking about peace making, I'm talking about a boldness. I'm talking about stepping into difficult, um, even hard situations. I'm talking about having wisdom and courage to step into those kinds of situations when it comes to peacemaking. Peacemaking takes so much more courage than we realize. But the first thing I would just want to mention about uh, when it comes to peacemaking and having courageous peace is peacemaking requires understanding. Peacemaking requires great understanding, whether it's people who are opposing each other or it's someone who's in opposition with you. It takes great understanding for, for a peacemaker to recognize what's really going on. Now, if you've been married for any length of time, you know that sometimes um, when there's conflict, it's a simple misunderstanding. Some of us who are married, we look back and we go, why did we argue about that? It was so silly. Or if you have kids or grandkids or maybe you've babysat before, sometimes you see two children that are having at it and simply it's a misunderstanding. They thought they did this, so they in turn did that, and it's a misunderstanding. So peacemaking requires great understanding. And today we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 25. And we're going to look at the story of Abigail who shows courageous 
piece, but I want to set this story up a little bit and kind of share a little bit of the context leading up to 1 Samuel chapter 25. Some of you may know the story of David. Raise your hand if you know the story of David and Goliath, okay? So David was anointed as a boy by the great prophet Samuel in a public display that David was going to be the next king of Israel, okay? So he immediately got like a million followers that day. It was a huge deal. Everyone was all about this, David's the next king. But then David proved it that he was worthy to be king when he slayed the giant Goliath. And you hear the story about David and Goliath, and he slays the Philistine giant, and it was incredible. And certainly he had a following after that. People started talking about him. They sang songs about him. If David had a shoe line, everyone would be wearing his shoes. I mean, all of that was going on for David. But what was going on with David and the king was something much worse. After David slays Goliath, for years, David began to ran for, run for his life because the jealous King Saul wanted David dead. And so time after time, there were attempts at David's life. Now, David is a skilled warrior. He is modern-day Jason Bourne. He understands how to have combat. He understands it. He is masterful at this. Killing Philistines was easy for David. So there was a time where King Saul was so jealous, and with spear in hand, King Saul throws the spear at David, and David so easily, like Neo in the Matrix, dodges it, okay, and the spear hits the wall, and then David goes and writes a psalm about it. He says, Lord, you are my refuge and ever-present help in times of trouble. But what David could have done is David could have taken up the sword. Time and time again, David was a masterful warrior, and King Saul, the jealous king, tried to kill David. And David, instead of going, oh, you throw a spear at me, huh? Well, if you're going to throw it, you don't miss, because now it's on, right? And you saw how I, I was with a sling. Check out how I am with my sword, right? So this is like he, he, time and time again, David had opportunities. There's another time where David, um, where, where King Saul is trying to kill David, and King Saul's alone in a cave, and David goes up and just cuts the corner of his clothes off and says, I could have killed you. I could have done it, but I didn't. Another time, the, I mean, literally his, his friends and the warriors around David was like, you have the opportunity. He's a jealous king. He's an unfit king. He's not worthy to be king. You are clearly God's anointed. You ought to take matters into your own hands, David. And guess what? We got your back. Everyone's already going to vote for you, David. It's great. This is perfect. This is the time. And so often we think of opportunities like this as like some kind of sign from God, but David did not see that. He didn't see this as an opportunity to kill the Lord's anointed. Instead, he goes, I could have done it, but not today. I'm not going to do this. And the Bible says he, he sees Saul as the Lord's chosen or anointed one, and he is not going to lay hands on that. This is in God's hands. And so here is David. This is how David feels. Time and time again, David is choosing the right thing when he could have, when he could have done it. But David chooses the right thing time and time again. Let me ask this question. Have you ever been tired of doing what was right? Have you ever been just worn out from doing good? It's sometimes interesting to me where we choose to obey God and often the moment after we obey God, it's like our obedience is met with resistance. Like all of a sudden, the next set, like you go to church, you go, yeah, I'm going to pray for the next president, I'm going to write cards, man, I'm going to go to church, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give, I'm going to serve, I'm going to engage, and then all of a sudden, the next day something happens in your life, in your family, in your friends, in your, at your work. And it's like, come on. And sometimes we get in a season of life where we're constantly doing the right thing, but it's almost like things around you are just getting worse and worse. This is where David is. 
It's like he's so fed up and so tired of doing what was right. It's like he's one bad coffee order away from losing it. You know what I'm talking about? Like that's why we, that's why we, we yell at, at the gas pump when it says, please see cashier. And you're like, that's it. And we, what, we, what we end up doing is we default. We default to go like, gee, Satan's attacking me right now. Satan's trying to get me. And we start kind of saying all these things. And we get angry. We get mad. We lose it. We go home. And it's like that. We see the, the pile of laundry. We see the sink that's full. It's like we're one bad negative comment on social media away from just completely losing our minds. This is where David is. He's been doing the right thing over and over and over again, and he's about to come into contact or have an interaction with a guy named Nabal. With a guy named Nabal. Now, Nabal, the name literally means fool. Okay, so I don't need to say much more after that, but this guy, Nabal, he was a wealthy man, but the Bible describes him as a surly and mean person. So he was just a, not a friendly person. He was mean, selfish, narcissistic. He cared about no one but himself. Like it was very much that kind of individual. And David's about to have an interaction with him. Now here's how basically the story goes. So David and his men had been caring for Nabal's shepherds and sheep. And it was the time of shearing, uh, essentially it was like their Thanksgiving. It was like a big celebration and party, and there was going to be an abundance of food. So David's like, oh, listen, I've had a bad day, a bad week. It's been a bad year, man. This has been hard. Well, at least we may be able to get some food. Why don't I send some men to Nabal and let him know, hey, we're nearby. We'd love to... Um, uh, receive some food. You're already going to be giving a lot of it away, you know, so why not? And he reminds him of a few things. So the message goes out, the men go, go to Nabal, and they start out by saying this in First Samuel 25, verse 6. It says, say, say this, long life to you, good health to you and your household, and good health to all that is yours. So basically, the men of David are just going, Nabal, we honor you, we praise you, like, good life to you, good health to you, like, it's all very honorable, great respect. And then David tells the men to remind Nabal that when his shepherds were with David's men, they protected and took care of their sheep and their shepherds. They could have overtaken them. They could have harmed them. They could have done anything they wanted, but they decided to care for them with great care. And this was uh, a few thousand sheep and shepherds. I mean, it was great care and they protected them. And David's like, remind them that this is what we did for you. And we would love to participate in what, what you're doing right now, right? Now, you would think... Nabal would at least go, all right, here's a few rations, right? Here's a few scraps, a few leftovers. But here's what Nabal says. He says this in verse 10. Who is this David? Who is this son of Jesse? Many servants are breaking away from their masters these days. Why should I take my bread and water and the meat I have slaughtered for my shears and give it to men coming from who knows where? Wow. So that message gets taken back to David. And David literally says, men, strap on your swords. It's on. If you can imagine the scene, you know the scene from the first movie, The Gladiator, Russell Crowe, when Russell Crowe reveals himself to the emperor, Show us your face, show us your name. And he turns around and Russell Crowe, his character, he goes, I am Maximus Decimus Meridius, father to a murdered son, husband to a murdered wife, and I will have my vengeance in this life or the next. <laughs> this is David right now. He ha his anger has been aroused and he literally says to 400 men, strap on your swords, I'm going and I'm killing everybody. 
I mean, this is where he's at. It threw him over the edge. And he's literally talking to himself. He gets all his soldiers and he says, let's go. And he's on his way there. He's literally going, oh, man, you just wait. Nabal, when I see you, oh, man, the first thing I'm going to do. Oh, man, I've got some plans for you. It's going to be on. I'm going to take you all out. It's happening tonight. And he literally says this. Okay, this is, this is the Bible. See, your Bible is awesome, okay? You got to read the Bible more, okay? Um, because... Uh, let me step aside for, for a moment here, okay? Because I know it's, you know, it's, this is my excuse for, for using a sword during a sermon, okay? <laughs> it's great, it's fun, but it's, it's drawing a point here. David was insulted, dismissed, and disrespected in that whole moment. And what his natural reaction was, was to draw the sword. So often... This is like you and me. So often, we draw the sword and we are literally just ready. We are one bad comment away from taking our swords out. We're, we're, we're one bad situation or, or co coffee gone wrong or, or something ha or someone cuts us off and, and, and we're just that one moment. It's all we need. And we're, we're standing here with sword in our hand. This is where David is. This is, this is the struggle. I read, uh, I read up on someone named uh, Dr. Jill Bolte-Taylor some time ago, and she is a neuroanatomist, brain scientist. She writes a book called My Stroke of Genius. It's actually a remarkable book because she has a stroke and then describes it. Like, it's incredible how, how it's described. One of the things she talks about is the 90-second rule. The 90-second rule. Here's what she says. It says, when a person has a reaction to something in their environment, there's a 90-second chemical process that happens in the body. After that, any remaining emotional response is just the person choosing to stay in that emotional loop. So she says, something happens in the external world, and chemicals are flushed through the body. This is certainly what's happening with David. Like something just happened in his world from Nabal. And he's feeling it. He says, it puts the body on full alert, she says. And then she says, for those chemicals to totally flush out of the body, it takes less than 90 seconds. This means for that 90 seconds, you can literally watch the process happen. The reaction, the feelings, the emotions, like all of it's all over the place. Ah, take the sword, punch the wall, whatever it might be. Like you're seeing it all happen. And then she says, it takes less than 90 seconds for it to flush out of your body. So she says this. So if you're still angry after 90 seconds, you're choosing to be. Now, this doesn't dismiss any kind of process that you need to have, counseling or working out of emotions that you need to have after those 90 seconds, because sometimes we need to work out some issues that take a while. But here's the point of that whole thing, that you and I don't have to be controlled by our emotions, that you and I don't have to be prisoners of any emotion, especially an emotion that is so ungodly in this moment where we're drawing the sword and we're saying, that's it, foolish Nabal, I'm taking you on and your whole household. We don't have to be controlled by that. There's, there's another way. And so peacemaking requires understanding. But what's also so important for us to do is to recognize that peacemakers step up in the conflict. Step up in the conflict. Here's what's important to note. Whenever there's conflict, there tends to be a default. Either we step aside and avoid the conflict altogether, ignoring it, or what happens a lot is people will pick a side. We'll either step aside or we will pick a side but like the Bible said, like Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. He did not say blessed are the side takers. <laughs> but what do, what, do we, what do we do? Like we hear the sides and we go, which one's right? Which one's wrong? I'm going to choose a side. And then we ally. And you know what we did? I didn't say this first service because this is 11 o'clock. You guys have had coffee and you're <laughs> ready to go. <laughs> Brene Brown, she actually talks about what's, uh, something called common enemy intimacy. Common enemy intimacy, okay? 
What that means and how she describes it in her research, some of you know, is that people will essentially bond over the things that they hate and call it true connection. Okay, here's what she obviously describes. It's a pseudo connection. It isn't real. It's powerful in that moment, but it isn't real. So people are literally going around going, well, who do you hate? Who do you hate? I don't like him either. Let's be best friends. Like, it, I mean, that's the short version, but that's what we do. We get all caught up in the things or people or people groups that we hate, and we have this common enemy intimacy, and that bond is powerful. But it isn't true connection, real connection. She describes true connection comes when we are bonding over the things that we love, joy, peace, it's important for us to recognize that because the world around us is going to try to lull us into things that they hate and call it connection. It's going to tempt us to draw and pick a side. Certainly Jesus felt this when the woman was caught in the act of adultery in the New Testament and the religious leaders said, she sinned and the Bible says she needs to die. What do you say, teacher? And if you know the story, mic drop moment, Jesus doesn't step aside. Jesus doesn't pick a side. He doesn't take sides. Jesus takes over and he says, he who is without sin cast the first stone. There is always another way. There is a third way that I'm describing here today that is the way that Jesus often wants us to walk. And when I'm talking about peacemakers, peacemakers step up in the middle of the conflict. Doesn't step aside or pick a side. They're right in the middle of it all. And the next scenes, if you will, of chapter 25, 1 Samuel, is remarkable. What happens next is this. There is a witness in the room, hearing Nabal's response to David's message. Who is this David? You know, well, how dare he? You know, kind of thing. There's a witness in the room, and the witness goes, oh, no. <laughs> Did Nabal just say that? Do you not know who David is? The warrior giant slayer? Are you kidding right now? No. And obviously, he's going, this is not going to be good. So this witness goes and finds Abigail. And she immediately, she doesn't waste any time, has the courage and says, I need to go to David. I need to go find David. I need to go to him and see if I can bridge peace. What is she doing? She's stepping in the middle of conflict. And as she goes, literally, David and his troops are there, and he's telling himself, and he's going, oh, okay, just wait till I get there, wait till I get there. And he says this, so Abigail finds him and, uh, in this ravine, and, and these, these troops are there. He's all upset. David's talking negative to himself. And David says this in verse 22, May God deal with, with David, be it ever so severely, if by morning I leave alive one male who belongs to him, that is to Nabal. Basically saying, God punish me if I, leave, if I let one of them live. He's going, I'm going to kill everybody. He's, say, he's saying, I'm essentially, this is from God. And so he's talking to himself, which is what we do when our emotions are high, judgment is low, and we have interactions with people who aren't even there with us, and we rehearse things in long drives home, and we're talking to ourselves. Well, you did this. Well, what about this? Well, I don't care. Well, that was wrong. And I'm like, no one is there. We're going crazy. <laughs> the sword is in hand. This is where David was. This is what he was doing. He was talking to himself. His emotions were all over the place. He goes, may, may be ever so severely that God, you punish me if I leave one of these men alive. I'm going to kill them all. I'm telling you, Lord, I'm telling you, I promise you, it's going to be for you, Jesus. I'm going to honor you with all these killings right now. Like, this is where he's at. And Abigail, Abigail goes straight there, straight to him. He goes straight to David. And she begins to describe something so profound. We could do a whole other message on just her presentation, but it, it was courage, it was tactful, it was strategic, it was intelligent, it was wise. It was so profound and astonishing how she came to him. So when she got to David, she literally bows to him and, and she calls him Lord and she honors him. She, she doesn't negate the fact that 
what her husband just said was extremely foolish. She also understands that he's been running from a jealous king and chances are he is exhausted. She is affirming and honoring and respecting. She then begins to bring up some other things. She, she reminds him of some of his high school successes, which is always strategic too. Remember when you killed Goliath? Remember what God did? And of course, she brings a bunch of food, which is also very tactful when you have an angry guy coming on the attack. Say, hey, I got some, I got some food here for you. Oh, okay, let's stop. Let's stop for a second. <laughs> she is so wise and so strategic and so courageous in this moment. And when peacemaking requires in these kinds of situations, it requires us not avoiding it, but stepping right in the middle of it. And here's where we find Abigail, this young lady. So, so peacemaking requires great understanding. It requires us to step in the conflict. And as we follow this story, just this chapter, you see Abigail doing some, some incredible things with David in that interaction. She is reminding him of the faithfulness of God in his life. That yes, slew Goliath, yes, did other things. God has continually been faithful to you. And just like you withheld moments from killing King Saul, this is yet another opportunity, David, where you can make the godly decision and be the king that you are called to be, not the way you're acting right now. And Abigail is presenting all of this to David. Now, chances are, if you're married to a guy named Nabal, fool, this isn't her first moment. I mean, chances are this is just a daily kind of thing. She's had some practice. David, trust me when I tell you, Nabal's just, just not having a good day. He's not making good choices. Like, come on. Like, th this isn't her first, first rodeo, if you will. And there's a really good chance she may have been acquainted with the Proverbs. Because in Proverbs 26, verse 4, it says this. Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you yourself will be just like him. Do not answer a fool according to his folly. But isn't that how so many of us do it? And don't we feel like that's exactly what will solve this? Like we think, okay, they did this, so I must do this. There's a, I need to reciprocate. I need to retaliate. And so it just makes sense. But like my children, why did you hit her? Because she hit me. <laughs> oh, welcome to the United States of America. Like that, like yeah. That's how we act, don't we? And I have to teach my children that isn't what you're supposed to do. What she did was wrong, but how you react to that actually is really important as you develop your character, as you grow to be a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ, as you are trying to be a leader in your community, whatever it might be, that sometimes when you look at the situation, we just react by saying, you are a fool, so I must be foolish too. And sometimes that's what we do. And Abigail reminds David of all of this. And it's so clear that David in that moment starts to recognize, oh man, what am I doing here? And so peacemaking requires understanding. It requires really us to step in the middle of that conflict, but peacemaking calls us to look beyond today. Peacemaking calls us to look beyond today. What is so hard for us to do is when our emotions are high, judgment's really, really low, and that's when we make huge life-altering decisions. When emotions are really high, like what we see in David in this moment, there's an emotion that happens and it's powerful. And what we do is it's so hard, we have this myopic vision, there's, there's no way for us to see beyond that moment. All we see is the offense. All we see is the comment that they just made on that, on that post, that's wrong, I need to say something. Or that message that you just got or that interaction that you just had, there's just this impulse that just we feel like we need to do something and it gets really hard for us to look beyond this moment or beyond today. See, what Abigail's doing is she's helping 
David, remember all that God has done. And guess what? You're the next king. You need to start living like you are today. Living that beyond today, there's something else God wants. And this interaction is not going to give you relief. Can I go a little deeper? 11 a.m. service. This is how we do it. Okay. (laughs) Think about this moment, this interaction with Abigail and David. David's greatest battles were never standing in front of him. They were within him. It was easy to kill Philistines. No problem. But David had the battle within Abigail was able to see past the moment and say, you're acting in a way that I know is not like you. You're dealing with some situations that I know is not like you. Abigail had the wisdom to see all of that. See, all of us are created. Every human being is created in the image of God. Whether or not you're acting that out or not in a godly, respectful manner, you are still created in the image of God. And so that person who who cuts you off at the carpool line or the pickup line at school, maybe there's something going on at home. Uh, that, that coworker who has just a grumpy attitude or, or he's, he feels really discouraged that he didn't get a promotion or something, maybe something's going on in his life. And with David, maybe there's something else going on. When he draws the sword and he wants to kill Nabal, but who is he really angry with? What is he really frustrated about? And here's what happens to us. When we are there, frustrated, at our wit's end, emotions are everywhere, we will take out the closest available target, which tends to be our family and our friends and the people close to us. Which is why we have fathers and parents who look back and go, why did I react that way with my kids? Why did I say that thing to my wife? I should not have said that. Why did I do it? Because this is how we we stand. This is what we think we need to do. But we need to learn to look beyond this moment, beyond today. We need a leader, we need a president who understands that peacemaking requires great understanding, requires the person to step into the conflict and bring about peace. And we also need someone who can look beyond today. And you and I need to live this out each and every day as well. And the last thing I just want to mention today is this. Peacemaking or peacemakers trust God for the outcome. Peacemakers trust God for the outcome. Again, we're not talking about peacekeeping. Peacekeeping minimizes the conflict, avoids it altogether at times, where peacemaking takes great boldness, steps in the middle of it all, and bridges the situations, reconciles the situations, brings about peace in the situations where there seems to be none. Trusting God for the outcome is so important. It's very difficult because we want to control the outcome, don't we? So often we just want to hold on to it. We don't want to surrender. We, we don't necessarily want to trust God. We, we just want to trust ourselves and our experience and our, notes, our, our insight. And so it's hard to let go. But as this story ends, it's, it's quite remarkable. Abigail is, has made peace with David. David's not going to come and kill all the, the household and, and everything's going to be great. She comes home and you might think that Nabal's just there like, where's my wife been? I really miss her. You know, what's going on? No. And, and you might even think like maybe he was going to greet her. Hey, dear, good to see you. None of that. She comes home and Nabal is drunk. And he's been drinking. And so again, in her wisdom goes, now's not the the right time to talk about this. I'll wait for morning. The next morning, she shares that she has brought peace to this situation. The Bible says that he became like stone. Some theologians believe maybe there was something with his heart. Regardless, 10 days later, Nabal dies. David hears about this. 
then sends his men to ask Abigail if she would be his wife. And they get married. And obviously Abigail goes, yep, let's pack things up today and we're going to go and hang out with David. And they live happily ever after, right? Okay. But here's the wisdom in that moment, okay? Abigail knew that there was a proper time. Do you know that most things in life can wait a day? Like we, we're so impulsive. I got I to gotta respond right now. I got to say something right now. I got to do this right now. Breathe. Pause before you make that post. Wait till the morning. So often there's great wisdom in just that one decision. It might seem obvious to us. Oh, he was drunk, you know. But, but so often we just need to wait. Wait on the Lord. To wait for the right timing. Sometimes we know what to do and how to do it, but not when. And we take that timing in our own hands. Do you remember the story of Peter? Peter in the garden when Jesus is about to be uh, arrested. Peter, and I, I relate to Peter, right? Peter draws his sword, actually takes a sword, takes the sword and swings at one of the soldiers, Malchus, and cuts off his ear. You know he wasn't going for his ear, right? No one, no one goes for someone's ear. Okay, you get it. He was going for his head. The guy kind of moves, slices his ear off. What does Jesus do? Does Jesus go, well done, Peter. I'm so glad you defended me. And from here on out, you ought to take the sword up and defend me at all costs because I need your defense in these moments. I need you to always take a stand and kill whoever stands against me. Let's go, Peter. No. It, it, I see your smiles. It sounds ridiculous. What does Jesus do in that moment? He goes, Peter. Oh, Peter. He says, put the sword away. If you live by the sword, you will die by the sword. But somehow we've convinced ourselves that living by the sword is the only way. And like Peter, we just, but I need to defend my Lord. Do you realize how critical that is in that moment? He's defending Jesus. All of us would have been like, go, go, Peter. we have been like junior hires instigating. Fight, fight, fight. I mean, it would have been, but no. So you could be doing the right thing at the wrong time and be completely out of God's will. Do you see how much wisdom is required? Do you see the story of Abigail coming into these moments with such profound wisdom and courage that she's able to see as God would have her see and she trusts God for the outcome and God took care of it all. In the season we're in today, you can describe it as chaos, uncertain. You can describe it as highly emotional. All, I can't get rid of opening up, I, opening up anything, any channel, YouTube, and it is just bombarded with all kinds of things. In the world where there is so much conflict, lean in on this please, where there's a overwhelming amount of chaos and confusion and arguing and war and all those things, how much more is God calling peacemakers to step in? Blessed are the peacemakers. Why? And they will be called what? Children of God. He's like, I'm counting on my kids right now. I'm counting on my kids in this season to be making peace, to build the bridges not to pick a side or, or step aside, but to be in the middle of it and say, how do we work this out? To have great wisdom and understanding of all of it and to trust God with the outcome. Today, you and I now have another opportunity to pray for the next president. This is critical. Nations against nations, rumors and wars and conflicts and all the things that are happening, not only abroad, but right here in our country, in our neighborhoods, in our community. We need a leader who's going to be so bold in these kind of moments to have the strength and courage as Abigail so greatly displays. And so there's an opportunity for you to, 
to write a prayer to that next president, to write a prayer for that next leader. And even as you leave today, on your way out, write that prayer, drop it in, and it'll be sent in January. Thousands of prayers. But also, what does that look like in your own life? Where has there been conflict in your life? Where there is conflict, there's an opportunity for peace. Let me pray. Oh, dear God, this is a difficult one because I know my emotions. And I know that my default is so often to grab the sword and to draw it. And boy, do I feel justified in that moment. But God, help us all to trust you. We don't know what's going to happen in November and in the coming days. But we know that you're in control of all of this. Help us to trust you. Help us to become laser focused on you. Whatever happens, whoever ends up in that office, God, I pray that they would be a person who is a peacemaker. God, help us to live that out in our daily lives and help us to continue to be the people you've called us to be and to be your children in such a time as this. In Jesus' name, amen.